recording. Let's go. So we're fortunate today to have uh, Dr. Jennifer <coughs> McIntosh for our colloquial speaker, and uh, she was also visiting this morning for the nice little uh, AWG get together out in the blog. I, I detected a hint of fall in the air. The temperature dropped below 120 degrees Fahrenheit, so a sure sign of fall is coming. Um, so um, Jennifer is a professor and distinguished scholar in the Department of Hydrology and Atmospheric Sciences. She also, she also holds a, um, a joint in the geosciences. Yeah. You did your undergrad studies at Whitman. Yeah. Object studies at, at uh, Michigan, right? And uh, then went on to do postdoctoral work at uh, Johns Hopkins University. Uh, and has been here since two, around 2006, I believe. Um, she receives, she's received numerous awards I'm not surprised as a teacher and researcher, including uh, the Oliver uh, Lectureship in Hydrology at Texas, at Texas Austin, the USGS Star Award. She has strong uh, USGS links and um, the U of A Blitzer Award for teaching physics related sciences. Jennifer uh, is a hydro, hydro geochemist who works at, on the interface or at the interface, as we'll hear today, um, of hydrology, geochemistry microbiology um, to understand subsurface processes. Uh, on a personal note, I've had the privilege of working on opposite Jennifer on many graduate, uh, many, many graduate committees, maybe too many, um, helping students toward, their, toward their, their degrees. And from this process, I think it's plain that she's a truly a gifted and dedicated major and uh, you've got to get her on her graduate, your graduate committee. Moreover, Jennifer speaks, um, definitely speaks our dialect of science. Uh, we often lament the fact that she's in hydrology and not geosciences, but I suppose that's okay. We get her for free. <laughs> to, that, to that end, just a heads up to grad students, by all means, take her classes. And uh, if relevant, get her on your on your, uh, on your Jennifer on your committee. Because she, um, I said, she's a, she'll, she'll serve you well. Okay, anyway, so the talk, Talk title today is uh, looks like an interesting talk. I'm looking forward to this. Geologic evolution of groundwater flow systems and the implications for subsurface microbial life. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Dave. That was a really personal introduction. I appreciate it. And just as a plug, it's great to see so many students that take my classes in here and colleagues. So I do teach fundamentals of water quality. I teach isotope hydrology, and I also teach an advanced aqueous geochemistry class. That's more project oriented, which I call water rock microbial interactions, which is yeah. Yeah. so look those up. So I thought I'd start my talk today with something that I'm really proud of and impressed by, which is uh, working with an artist over the last year and a close colleague of mine, Grant Ferguson at the University of Saskatchewan. This artist, who's actually also a scientist, Dr. Luis Arnold, created this beautiful book that represents our research, in particular in the Western Canada sedimentary basin. And this one, this picture really resonates for me because I'm not only a mother, but resonates because I study deep groundwater, which is typically saline. And you can't really tell it, but it's a block print and she's put salt on here to represent those saline fluids. And I want to emphasize that water is not only lifeblood for us, but it's also the lifeblood for microorganisms in the deep subsurface. And that's what I want to talk about today. <laughs> So I've been inspired by two very large interdisciplinary projects over the last couple of years. Um, the first one is funded by the CIFAR, which is this nonprofit kind of think tank in Canada that brings together international scientists around a topic. And our topic is Earth 4D subsurface science and exploration. And what it's done for me is kind of broaden my perspective to think about not only water and life on Earth, but on other planets through working with planetary scientists. And when we explore for water and life on places like Mars, there's been an emphasis, although we don't have samples, of the deep subsurface, that if water still exists today, it's likely in the subsurface, and that's where we might go looking for life. And it's also made me think more globally, and I think you'll see some of those themes today. And then the second project has been, I think, my favorite project over the last five years. I see Isabel and Amanda and Pete's leading it through the funded by the Keck Foundation. And it really got my group working up in the Colorado Plateau and thinking about geological time and how fluids and multiple fluid events can lead to really interesting phenomena that's important, for example, copper mineralization. So thinking about the sequence of events 
um, which I'll talk a little bit more about today. So my field, as Jay described, is at the intersection of water, geology, and microbiology. There's a lot of open questions that my research group addresses, um, kind of starting really big picture. And I call it the Earth's hydrant, Earth's hidden hydrosphere. You could call it hydrogeosphere. And this was a term that was coined by, coined by Oliver War in a paper in 2018. And there he was really talking about crystalline bedrock and deep groundwater down to about four kilometers. But the hidden part to illustrate the fact that we have relatively few windows into the subsurface to sample and observe and characterize these fluids and then the life associated with them. So my research group over the last several years has really focused on the distribution, transit time and quality of groundwater from the Earth's surface down to 10 kilometers, which is about the maximum depth of water. Understanding what the distribution of subsurface biomass is and its history tied to that water. And then thinking about how changes to the Earth's surface has impacted both deep water and life and how this deep water and life might be connected not only to the surface, so think more watershed scale, but also even deeper fluids, such as some of these fluids that have been isolated since the Archean, for example, in crystalline bedrock. So why should we study the deep subsurface? And by deep, I mean really beyond about one to two kilometers up to 10 kilometers. Well, we've not only exploited oil and gas for you know, over hundred years, as we move to a greener economy, we still need to use the subsurface. So we're talking about extracting resources like lithium and rare earth elements to, for example, power my family's two electric cars. We're also talking about disposing of waste products. So geologic CO2 sequestration, spent nuclear fuel. So they're starting to do that in Sweden and Finland, for example, and even hydrogen production, not only the um, production of hydrogen, but also the storage of hydrogen, for example. And then our characterization of the subsurface, that data or those parameters go in, into all sorts of things like geochemical budgets of the planet, as well as our estimates of subsurface biomass. So I hope you'll keep that in mind as I go throughout the talk of why this is important. So I thought I'd start with this recent paper that Professor Grant Ferguson, my close colleague at University of Saskatchewan led with the CIFAR team, was to ask the simple question, what is the volume of deep groundwater? So to date, before this paper, we had pretty good constraints from Tom Gleason and others in the upper two kilometers. So we found it's about 22.6 million kilometers cubed of, of water. And then from Oliver War and Barbara Shore Lawler's group, we know that from the Precambrian basement rocks, we've got an additional eight and a half million kilometers cubed of water. Well, what we did is we said, we want to understand the volume of water in the whole package of the Earth's crust, shallow crust, including the deeper sediments, because we know that there's deep sediments in places like the Gulf of Mexico. So what's the water volume in those, as well as considering Phanerozoic crystalline rocks. So we were able to do this calculation because of a new data set of sediment thickness. So we took that sediment thickness map and calculated based on porosity relationships, took the crustal volume and the porosity relationships with depth, which I'll stop there and describe for a second. For sediments, porosity decreases exponentially with depth due to compaction and diagenesis. For crystalline rocks, there's debate, but most studies have assumed an invariant porosity with depth. And so that's what we did in this study. So through doing that, we were able to calculate the volume of deep groundwater, again, from the surface to 10 kilometers. And what we were surprised to find is that if we do incorporate this deep groundwater, which is primarily saline, we have more water in the subsurface on the continents than we do in the ice sheets. And if you look in your textbook, Prior to the study, we would say that the ice sheets were the largest volume of water um, on the continents. And so this made a splash in nature where they nicely said a staggering store of water is revealed in the Earth's crust. So that was kind of the take home message. But I think it's really important to quickly say that there's a lot of groundwater, but the majority is too saline to use for water supply. Okay. 
And beyond about one kilometer, most of the water is above seawater salinity. Okay? And it wouldn't make any sense to desalinate that water and use it for human consumption. And so we published a paper a couple of years ago where we map out the depth of fresh to brackish groundwater across the United States. So I just wanted to make the point that again, beyond one kilometer, most of that water is above seawater salinity. And most of that deep groundwater is relatively old. So there was another paper by Tom Gleason and others where they measured tritium in groundwater. Tritium came from nuclear weapons testing in the 1950s and 60s. So if you detect it in high levels in groundwater, we know that that water was recently recharged. And so it was really looking at the absence of tritium. And what he found is that over 97% of all groundwater is fossil, meaning recharged prior to the 1960s. I think that's really interesting because as a geologist, I love to think about old things, old water, and thus the geological history of water. So if we look at it in a little bit more detail, um, my PhD student, ji Hun Kim, compiled this data from a paper by Scott Jacheco and others. And it showed that beyond about one kilometers, most of the water is older than 50,000 years old. And the 50,000 year mark is really related to carbon-14 dating. So carbon-14 dating gets, gets you to about 35 to 50,000 years old. So beyond that, we're talking of time scales of likely tens of thousands to hundreds um, to even millions of years old. So if we look at the even older water based on other dating techniques, such as helium-4, which comes from uranium thorium decay of rocks. I just wanted to point out some of the time scales of these waters, that again, they're really on the order of tens of millions of years old. So some cases, the age of the sediment, if it was, for example, Paleozoic seawater that was trapped in these sediments as they were being deposited. And the oldest water on Earth comes from the deep mines in Kid Creek and Sudbury, which is up in Ontario in the Canadian Shield and Barbershire Lawler's group has dated those at about 1.8 billion years old. So what I think is really interesting is not just the oldest waters, but really the interface between water that is freely circulating on timescales of thousands to millions of years, interfacing with these much deeper fluids that are likely trapped for more geologic timescales. And if we look for the deepest relatively young water, we find it in the highest terrain. So you find the deepest Pleistocene age water in this basin in China. And it's a geothermal system. So it's a high mountain range with deep groundwater circulation. So keep that in mind, because I'm gonna come back to that point. And so we can, we can think about deep groundwater in a slightly different way besides the age of the water. We can look at the origin of the water. And so there's something we call meteoric water in my field. And it's just a fancy term for water that's been in contact with the atmosphere. It came from precipitation. It's different than water that came from seawater or hydrothermal systems that's been altered by water rock reaction or even these shield type lines. So meteoric water means it's still carrying the signature of precipitation. And so Grant Ferguson and I went into the USGS Produced Water Database, as well as their NACWA Water Quality Database. And we just compiled all the data from the surface to as deep as we can go of water-stable isotopes across the North American continent. And we went looking for groundwater that still carries this meteoric signature. So here I'm showing you it's data that plots along what we call the global meteoric water line. So still carrying that precipitation signature. And so then what we did is we, you know, we had to bound it because there's some variability around that line. And then we mapped it out across North America based on what the studies have suggested as being the deepest circulation. So this is coming from, for example, in geothermal systems, what do they find from geothermometry as the deepest circulation depth? And that's what we assigned here. And so what we found across the North American continent is that there's variability, but it's somewhat predictable 
So in the Western United States, for example, you get the deepest circulation of meteoric water. And there's places where meteoric water circulates beyond four kilometers. For example, in some of the hydrothermal systems along the Rio Grande Rift, for example, and up in the Rockies. In contrast, the shallowest circulation of meteoric water happens in the Midwestern US, in like the Great Lakes region, where the topography today is really shallow. I lived in Michigan for six years and I hated it. Um, and you've got saline brine close to the surface. And so it's difficult to get deep circulation. So again, we can, we can predict the locations of where you find circulating meteoric water based on the topography relative to the depth of those samples. And so we call that the topographic drop to depth ratio. And the way that you could think about it is like the geometry of the flow system. Water is primarily driven by topography in these you know, meteoric flow systems. And where you've got high topographic gradients, like in mountainous regions, you can get water to deeply circulate. And so that's why we find the circulating meteoric water, again, beyond four kilometers, in places that have the highest topographic drop to depth ratio. So that's as we would suspect. What I think is equally or more interesting is the outliers. So in some locations, like the Michigan Basin, we find meteoric water at depths that you would not predict based on today's topography. And so if I go all the way back to my master's and PhD back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, this is what I studied. I studied Michigan underneath the Pleistocene ice sheets. So I studied groundwater that was derived from melting of those ice sheets. And the ice sheets not only provided the water, they provided the hydraulic head. Okay, so the Laurentide ice sheet, for example, added four one, one to four kilometers of topography on top of the Michigan basin. And so we find glacial meltwater deep into the Michigan and the Illinois basin, as well as up in Canada, because of that, uh, those ice sheets. More recently, my colleague Mark Persson and a PhD student of his, Ai Peng Zhang, showed that the ice sheets not only supplied water and head, but it actually changed the permeability structure of the underlying sediments. So it actually caused natural hydraulic fracturing because of overpressuring of the water of the shales. So I introduced that concept because changes in permeability is important for driving water into the subsurface. And it did all sorts of really interesting things like cause induced seismicity um, in the Midwest. So on the other end of the spectrum are places where the groundwater looks like trapped Paleozoic seawater, but yet the topography is high enough, the topographic gradient is high enough, it should have been flushed. And we find trapped seawater at shallow depths today. And so one example of that will be the Paradox Basin in the Colorado Plateau that I'm gonna come back to. So we hypothesize, I'll just give it away, that these are locations where this high topographic gradient is a recent geological feature. And that if we go back further in geological time, there wasn't enough topography or the permeability inhibited deep circulation of meteoric water. So I'll come back to that. So we can look at the circulation patterns in a different way. And we can ask the question, where and why are saline fluids not flushed? So the other side of the coin, where in the world do we find high density fluids, which are normally derived from evaporated Paleozoic seawater in locations in sedimentary basins that may or may not have been flushed because of topography? So we wrote a paper in 2018 where we looked at sedimentary basins um, across North America in terms of their geometry. And we said that everything in red, based on the chemistry and the isotope composition of those fluids, this is trapped Paleozoic seawater. 
And for all of these basins, primarily they have topographic um, relationships that would suggest that there's not enough topography to flush those brines. So the reason you retain these saline old fluids is because you can't get deep enough meteoric circulation to flush them out. The one place that- ask a quick question? Uh -huh. Yeah. How do you know it's Paleozoic? Is oh. it from the dates or? Yeah, geochemistry. So, okay. and a lot of inference. But for example, brine trapped in evaporites looks like highly evaporated seawater beyond potash salts. It's got action hydrogen isotopes that plot to the right of the meteoric water. So we put all these things together and then we date the water using helium-4. We say it looks really exact. Yeah. So, so I don't have time to go into all the fun geochemistry. But the one place when we published this paper in 2018 that really stood out was the Paradox Basin, which is in the Colorado Plateau. The Paradox Basin contains trapped Paleozoic seawater, yet if you've been to places like Moab in the Canyonlands and the Colorado River, there's quite a bit of topography there today. So based on today's topography, we would expect that you'd have deep meteoric circulation and flushing of those brines. So why don't we? So that um, kind of leads me to start to talk in more detail about the Paradox Basin. So again, I got introduced by geologists in this department um, about four years ago when we started working up there as part of this tech project. And as a um, hydrogeologist who works on old fluids, this place is really interesting because there's so many manifestations, Pete likes to call it, manifestations of paleo fluid flow. Um, and this, this map, Isabel helped with a lot. But we see things like CO2 accumulations. In some places, it's magmatic. We see lots of bleached sandstones, which indicates um, a reducing fluid and mobilization of iron. We see uranium, vanadium, copper deposits, all indicating that there's been a really dynamic fluid flow history and water rock reaction in this basin. So about four years ago, um, <laughs> Jihoon Kim came on the scene on this project, and she's really been the one leading um, everything that I'm going to present um, about the Paradox Basin. So we went in there to study what modern fluids look like. That's what he likes to call them, and I always make fun of, fun of them for it because they're not modern. They're like, in some cases, Paleozoic. But the fact that they're still present, I guess, to a hard rock geologist, they're like modern. But we started calling them neofluids, but it basically means fluids that could have been deposited in the Paleozoic all the way up to today. So that's what we've been studying in the basin. And this is a picture I put in to show you the types of locations for where we get these kinds of samples. So going all the way from the surface, we sample rivers and springs, shallow monitoring wells, and then from the deeper subsurface, we sample oil and gas wells. So I, for a long time, had relationships with oil and gas companies to get access to these deepest samples. And then more recently, there's been a lithium boom in the Paradox Basin. They're wanting to extract lithium from these very saline fluids. And so there's a couple exploratory lithium wells that are artesian. So let's, let's get to some of the data, the geochemistry. So we bring all those water samples back to my lab and we measure them for their chemical composition and isotopes. And I usually say we measure almost everything on the periodic table, everything from major ions to rare earth elements and lots of different isotopes. But I'm just gonna highlight some of the key things. So the first thing that we discovered is that we found the mother brine is what I call it. So within the Paradox Formation, which is a over kilometer thick salt, there's this highly saline evaporated paleos, I'm assuming Paleozoic seawater. And it's der no, again, derived from evaporated seawater. And so a lot of the brines show a mixing of a evaporated Paleozoic seawater with meteoric recharge in the other formations. And I'm keeping it kind of high level, not going into a lot of detail. 
We also know from the water stable isotopes that these are again derived from evaporated seawater because they plot to the right of the New York water line. And this is actually a mixing line between this highly evaporated seawater dry brine and meteoric water. So that's the first type of salinity coming from trapped seawater. The second type is more recent. So that deep meteoric water circulation that I was talking about, if that water comes in contact with, with salt near the surface, and in the Paradox Basin, it's world famous for its salt dye appears. So that brings salt close to the surface. You have circulation in meteoric water that dissolves the salt, and it has a different chemical composition than this seawater derived brine. It's really enriched in chloride and sodium because it's mostly halite, and its water stable isotopes look like meteoric water because it's not being modified by dissolving salt. So the first thing we found is that there's these two sources of highly saline brine in the Paradox Basin. One that's trapped residual seawater, one that's related to meteoric circulation and dissolution of salt. That deep Paleozoic seawater within the evaporites did migrate. And so we see evidence for that above the salt. And this is, Throughout the Colorado Plateau, you see these bleached sandstone units that, for example, Lydia has been studying. So this slide comes from Lydia, where she shows in places like Rainbow Rocks, which is this amazing paleo oil reservoir, kind of, I guess, northwest of Moab. What we think happened is that those seawater-derived brines brought hydrocarbons up into these celestoclastic formations that used to be red. They turned white because that brine was very reducing. It contained a lot of hydrogen sulfide and it reduced the iron, transported it, and precipitated it elsewhere. This oil that it left behind is yummy material for microorganisms. And so I'm going to come back to that a little bit later in my talk. But that's why I'm interested in rainbow rocks, is I see the residual oil the bitumen that's left behind. So I've talked about drivers of fluid flow, primarily topographic. There are obviously other drivers of fluid flow. But you not only need a gradient, and that's the driver, you need a conduit for fluids. And I'm introducing this concept called dynamic permeability because often hydrologists think about permeability of rocks as a very stagnant view. We, got, we measure it from core or from pump tests. But if you think like a geologist, we have so much time for rocks to change and move and to open up porosity and then for porosity to decay. And so there's been some pretty famous studies in my field that talk about dynamic permeability. And the idea that you may have an event, you know, this could be earthquake driven, tectonic driven, you know, whatever the driver is, that can open up a fracture or a fault for a period of time. And it can enhance the permeability by orders of magnitude. And then of course the decay through precipitating minerals. So the point that I wanted to make is that you not only need a driver, but we also need permeability. And we need these things to happen at the same time. So I'll come back to that point. So we hypothesized that episodes of paleofluid flow like the reducing fluids coming up from the paradox formation salt and bleaching sandstone occurred not only when you had a driver, in that case, it was overpressuring from hydrocarbon generation from deep burial. We also had to have conduits open for those fluids to migrate. So if we turn to, I was just talking about the deepest burial history in the basin. If we go to the most recent history of the Colorado Plateau, the action has been all about denudation. And I probably use the wrong word. He always corrects me. I call it erosion because I know it's denudation or incision. Basically what happened is the Colorado Plateau, the sediments have been removed from the top. So for example, if we go back to the Paleocene, Here's the thick paradox salt. And on top of it was the Manco Shale. So as a hydrologist, to me, the Manco Shale is a giant confining unit. It's impermeable to having meteoric water infiltrate and flush 
fluids from below. If we go to the present, we see there's been a lot of sediment removed from the top. These salt diapirs are exposed near the surface. And there's also a drain. So the Colorado River, incision of the Colorado River, creates a drain that then allows for groundwater circulation. The point that we don't really see in these figures is what the water tower was. So in the Colorado Plateau, there are these mountains in the interior, and I don't think you can really see them in this figure, but places like the LaSalle Mountains, which are the beautiful snow-capped mountains around Moab, those were the water towers. So those were present. So once you unroofed the basin, removing that confining unit of the Manco Shale, and you created the drains with the Colorado River, you set up the plumbing to have meteoric circulation. But the point that I want to make is that only happened within about the last three to 10 million years. So pretty recent in the history of the Colorado Plateau. So what was the effect of this recent meteoric circulation? Well, we see a lot of dissolution of salt. So at the top of the basin. So this is a really prime example. So in the back, what looks white, that's the snow-capped peaks of the LaSalle Mountains. This is one of the famous salt valleys. It's called the Paradox Valley. Water recharges, and we can tell, you just have to trust me, we can tell all this from isotopes and dating. We know meteoric water recharges at the LaSalle's and flows underground through these siliciclastic sediments like the Jurassic aquifers, dissolves salt that's right beneath the surface and actually was discharging into this river. This is called the Dolores River. The Bureau of Reclamation now has pumping wells that extract that brine, because that brine is over 200,000 milligrams per liter TDS. It's a huge source of salinity to the Colorado River, because the Dolores River is a major tributary to the Colorado River. So to reduce salinity on the Colorado River, the Bureau of Reclamation actually extracts that brine close to the surface and re-injects it at the bottom of the basin in the Leadville limestone. So to me, it's exciting because I can go sample those wells and measure the chemistry and look for microbes and all sorts of things. The other point I wanted to make is that salt dissolution is not only happening shallow at the top of these salt diapirs, it's actually happening at the bottom of the basin. So beneath that salt, if I just go back one slide, if we look at today's stratigraphy, these are basal Mississippian and Devonian aquifers that are beneath the salt. And they seem very isolated in this picture, but they're actually connected to the LaSalle Mountains. So you can still have recharge to these basal aquifers. And you're actually dissolving the salt from the bottom. And we can see that by looking at the chemistry of these very deep brines. And so we see waters in the Mississippian and Devonian formations that are subsalt that have a chemical signature of dissolving halite. Here we're showing it as sodium chloride ratios because that's the most widespread data that's available, but I measure it using bromide as well. And if we do a calculation based on the salt flux in the Dolores River, and we make a bunch of big arm wavy assumptions about how much time this flow system has been established, at least since the Pleistocene, we've calculated about 400 meters of salt has been dissolved from the Paradox Valley. And that fits with Steve Lingry's stratigraphic reconstructions, which is nice. But we see it not only in the Paradox Valley, we see it in all the other salt valleys that emanate out from these mountains in the Colorado Plateau. So very similar plumbing. As a hydrobiogeochemist, what excites me is not only the salt dissolution, but the biological activity. So you're not only dissolving halite, but interbedded with that halite is gypsum. And so you release sulfate. Interbedded with that gypsum and halite is black shale. Well, that is ripe for what's called bacterial sulfate reduction. So bacteria use that sulfate and they use that black shale and they reduce the sulfate to hydrogen sulfide. So those brine pumping wells that are shallow in the Dolores River, they're releasing over 200 milligrams per liter hydrogen sulfide. 
Yeah, so if you know anything about that, that's really high. I love this slide. It makes it makes me feel like seem dangerous, but it's not. It's all outside. But anyways, we know there's that this was created by bacteria because we see that they fractionated the sulfur isotopes. So we've measured all that. What we haven't done is actually measured the microbes, but we're gonna do that. So stay tuned. So moving on to, I think some of the most exciting results from Ji Hoon's work is the age of these waters. These waters that are circulating from the LaSalle mountains to above and below the salt. So how do we date these things? You know, in the Paradox Valley, circulation time scales are within the last 50,000 years. So we can use carbon-14, but beyond that, we have to use other tracers. And so typically for dating old groundwater, most people use helium-4, which I described comes from uranium-thorium decay, but it's challenging. There's so many assumptions that go into helium-4 dating, the external flux, the aquifer properties, the uranium-thorium content of the aquifer. So we'd like, we'd like an additional tracer. And about 10 years ago, this new tracer came on the scene called Krypton-81. And it's really exciting because it has a long half-life um, and allows you to date waters up to 1.3 million years old. Starts at about 40,000. So it kind of starts where carbon-14 ends and it gets you to about 1.3 million years. It only comes from the atmosphere naturally produced in the atmosphere, gets recharged with groundwater, and then it radioactively decays. And there's no subsurface sources. So it sounds ideal. The problem is that there, one, krypton is in really low levels in groundwater. So it used to be that you had to collect something like 10,000 liters of water in the field to bring it to the lab. <laughs> so that's where there's like one krypton study from the Nubian sandstone aquifer that made a big splash about 10 years ago. So the latest and greatest is actually a gas extraction device that my colleagues in China made for my research group, which I'm incredibly lucky, and Ji Hoon has become the expert on operating. So we take it in the field and you plumb it to the well, and then you wait about four hours. You let the water run through it, and there's a gas permeable membrane that extracts the krypton and all the other dissolved gases into this stainless steel canister. Sounds easy, it wasn't. This pump died about four times because of the red dust in Moab. It was the nemesis of this thing, but she finally got it working. So what do her results look like? So the data is somewhat in stratigraphic order. So here's the Pennsylvania Paradox Formation, which is the, the salt. And what she showed is that, again, the shallow aquifers have krypton-81 ages that are similar to carbon-14. They're Pleistocene to Holocene in age. We see an oxygen isotope shift to cooler, cooler, wetter climate in the Pleistocene compared to the Holocene. But as we go down with depth into the Permian-Cutler formation and the Hanover Trail above the salt, we find groundwater that is up to about 900,000 years old. So it gives us some constraints on the time scale of circulation. What was shocking to us is that we found 800,000 year old water, which to me is young, beneath the salt in these basal aquifers. I expected age to increase with depth. And instead we found relatively young water at the bottom of the basin. In retrospect, that makes sense. Now that we put all the pieces of the puzzle together, and we see that there's meteoric water. We see there's a lot of salt dissolution. And this gives us an idea of what the time scales were. I'm gonna skip over the helium-4 results because they're a totally different story. But I am gonna show you some noble gas data that shows that at the bottom of the basin, we've got noble gases that have actually been flushed by this recent meteoric water circulation. So, and I think I'm getting short on time. So I'm gonna kind of skip over a few things to get us moving forward to talk about the microbiology. So we know something about meteoric circulation and we think that it is impacted by the geological history 
of the Colorado Plateau, that recent denudation, driving recent infiltration, and why you retain these brines close to the surface. But we want to now know how has that impacted the have habitability or conduciveness for the subsurface for microbial life. We know that microbes are found in a lot of locations in the Earth's crust, down to four kilometers. We know that the majority of biomass in the subsurface is microbial. It's mostly bacteria and archaea. And we have some idea today what the depth of microbes might be based on the geothermal gradient. So we know microbes can survive up to the maximum temperature that's been measured is about 122 degrees Celsius. I would argue that's too hot. Most studies that have looked at multiple parameters, environmental conditions for microbes, think that it's more like 80 degrees Celsius. So there is a temperature limit, and that's often what kills microorganisms in the subsurface. So to me, looking at microbes today is a very static view. Again, as a geologist, I want to know how has movement of the Earth's crust and change in the geothermal gradient and circulation of water impacted the history of microbes in the subsurface. So I go back to this really simple cartoon from years ago. And you can think of that there's a biogenic floor. There's a maximum temperature and thus a maximum depth at which microbes can survive. But if we think about the Earth's shallow crust going up and down, going down with deep burial, you reach above 80, 100 degrees Celsius when you generate oil and gas. So periods of oil and gas generation, you would have sterilized reservoirs for microbes. Maybe as you brought this back up close to the surface, you unroofed, removed those confining units, circulated water, you possibly could have re-inoculated. And with this idea, you know, this is not necessarily a new idea. Back in 2001, um, several co-authors looked at oil reservoirs and they looked for evidence of biodegradation. And interestingly, there's oil reservoirs that were charged by deeper burial of source rocks, but those oil reservoirs never reached above 80 degrees Celsius. And today you see that that oil is heavily biodegraded you have meteoric water circulating, bringing in microbes that are degrading that oil. Where if you go to the other end of the spectrum, you find basins where those shallow reservoirs were deeply buried, sterilized, and then never re-inoculated. And so in those places, you don't find the heavy, what we call heavy oil, the really biodegraded oil. So this also goes back to my PhD roots and my, one of my first PhD students, Melissa Schlegel, we looked at this issue in the, in the Illinois basin. And she looked at the thermal maturity of source rocks, so Devonian black shales and Pennsylvania poles. And what she showed is that the source rocks reached a high enough temperature that you should have sterilized them. Yet we find microbial methane from methanogenesis along the margins of the Illinois basin. And the same thing for the Michigan. If you look at the hydrology story, you see that glacial meltwater recharged into these black shales and coals could have transported microorganisms into them and re-inoculated them. And we see all sorts of cool evidence for that, including isotopes of carbonate, cements, and the shales and the coals that look microbial, et cetera. We date the water and we know that this happened in the Pleistocene. So again, these source rocks were sterilized and re-inoculated recently with that glacial meltwater recharge. So I think I want to save time for questions. So I'll go, I think I'll skip through the Appalachian Basin example, which is kind of the other end of the spectrum. So I'll return back to the Paradox Basin where we have a hint of biodegradation. So my student, ji Hoon Kim, she's been looking at all of the isotopes of natural gas, looking for biodegradation. And what we find is that the majority of the natural gas throughout the basin, it's all thermogenic in origin. We know about the burial history. We know it generated oil and gas. 
but we possibly see this overprint of additional fractionation as microbes consume ethane and propane. And we can see it, it's more sensitive in the isotopes of ethane and propane than it is of methane. So this enrichment is possibly from biodegradation. So to try to confirm this, we've recently been working with Shuhai Ono at MIT to do clumped isotopes of methane, which I in part threw in for Jay and Nitsum to show clumped isotopes. And really what we find are data here, all plots in the thermogenic gas field. But more recent interpretation would suggest that some of these gases are really early stage thermogenic gas that is out of equilibrium. It's still affected by kinetic processes. And those gases that show this enrichment in carbon isotopes from biodegradation also show kinetic fractionation. So there was an awesome paper that just came out this summer that really helps ji Hoon interpret her data. And the reason I love this paper is it really puts geological time on here and thinks about the distance from equilibrium with clumped isotopes. That initially early stage gases generated with oil are out of equilibrium. You reach equilibrium and then you can say something about the temperature formation. But then more recently in a basin history, if you were able to influx meteor water with microorganisms, they can be degrading that gas or that oil and affecting the clumped isotope signature. So I'll show you it just conceptually. This is what we think is happening in the Paradox Basin. We think that those deep trapped Paleozoic seawater and the hydrocarbons associated with it were expelled during maximum burial into the shallow formations and did all sorts of cool things like bleach the sandstones. But why I'm interested in this is it created a hot spot for later microbial activity. So it took these deep hydrocarbons and it put them closer to the surface. So that during this time period in the Colorado Plateau, meteoric circulation was probably pretty limited because of the Manco Shale. But in the last three to 10 million years, when you remove the Manco Shale, you deeply incise the Colorado River, you all of a sudden set up this deep circulation of meteoric water that could have brought microorganisms in contact with those hot spots of organic rich material and created a perfect condition for bacterial sulfate reduction because I should have mentioned that meteoric water is dissolving the salts and generating sulfate. So you're bringing sulfate rich water in contact with that black shale. And that leads to anaerobic oxidation of hydrocarbons. So I'm cognizant that we're probably running out of time to leave time for questions. So I'll just briefly end with two slides. Um, so all of this work in the Colorado Plateau through the PET Foundation project, as well as my CIFAR work, kind of thinking about deep space and time, has led us to a recently funded project by the National Science Foundation in the FRESS program, where we're essentially gonna go looking for life with this hypothesis that in the Colorado Plateau, there were time periods and places where the conditions would have been sterilized or not conducive to life. And that this recent landscape level change of the Colorado Plateau has possibly re-inoculated these deep reservoirs. And how are we gonna find life besides sampling all these waters that my group does? We're gonna look at the rocks. And so we've got colleagues like Henrik Drake and Maggie Osborne that are experts at finding signatures of life in those rocks from the isotope composition to the morphology to even the lipids or the biomarkers that are left behind. So stay tuned as we start this five-year um, endeavor. And just to mention that, you know, Pete's group, um, spearheaded by Lydia, we're not only going to go looking for life, we're going to try to date paleo fluid flow events so we can put those two things together. So we know the timing and we know the potential for biology, but we also want to know something about the drivers and the patterns of circulation of those fluids. So 
In conclusion, I hope I've left you with the idea that there's more water in the subsurface than the ice sheets, that it's still a scientific frontier, as most of what we know is from the upper two kilometers, that we can predict the depth of meteoric water circulation versus retention of saline fluids based on you know, things like topographic gradient, and that many locations are out of equilibrium because they're still responding to past tectonic or geologic or climatic forcings. And that the Paradox Basin is an awesome place to play and work because there's so many examples of the phenomena that I was talking about. And that why should you care? Because we're all gonna to continue to use the subsurface. Even if we abandon oil and gas wells, we still are gonna to need to store things. We're gonna to need to extract things from the subsurface. So thank you for your attention and thanks to all of the students um, that were really behind all of this work, collaborators, all of the industry partners that help us give access to samples. And I'll end with, again, one of my favorite pictures from Dr. Arnold's book, emphasizing how precious our water resources are, even though they're vast, they're still limited. So thank you for your attention. I'll just handle the questions that may come from the chat over here as well. Um, two questions if I can. Uh, one, uh, the age of groundwater using any of the data? Yeah, yeah. That's It absolutely depends on what what technique you're using. So the Krypton 81, it's the last time that water was in contact. That's why I blew over the helium floor results because we can have old helium floor at the bottom of the basin, but the water can be young. So it really depends on what you're dating. So what does that date then mean in terms of, it's when it's been put back into that formation? Yeah, the helium, Basically, what it looks like it's happening is you've had you've had a flux of helium four from the basement into those aquifers beneath the salt, and the salt is a, a fantastic seal, and so you've accumulated helium four over geological time. You've had recent flushing by meteoric recharge, and so the krypton dates are really young, but the helium four is really old, and there's like a gas cap of helium four at the bottom of the basin. So, so the helium is not actually dating the water. Right. Say. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. And, yeah. and then if I can, um, so it seems like the master control on all this denudation is the integration of the Colorado River with the ocean. I mean, that's, none of this can go on until you have that hydraulic hit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so did I understand you earlier that glaciation can depress the brine level? There's an ice sheet. So then, is there any sort of implications, I guess, for humans in the next maybe 100 years or so as ice sheets are retreating, uh, especially towards northern areas? Yeah. Um, that's my thought about that. Well, one, we're still drinking glacial meltwater in places like Chicago. Um, I think the Greenland ice sheet is so interesting because there's springs underneath the Greenland ice sheet that are discharging into the ocean. So it's showing what that plumbing system may have looked like on the continents years, you know, 15,000 years ago. What's gonna happen when the green ice sheet all melts? That I'd, I'd have to think longer about. Or I mean, the saline level, that? Um, yeah, I guess to be honest, I don't know what's underneath the Greenland ice sheet in terms of the geology to be able to tell you. But we still see, even in crystalline rocks like the Canadian Shield, we still see glacial meltwater in the subsurface. That's a good question. Yeah, I have kind of two follow up questions um, about the Michigan Basin and the Mark I see. Um, and the first is a question about sort of the cumulative effect of repeated Pleistocene glaciations down over the Michigan Basin and that the way that you described it was that you know the Laurentide ice sheet retreated once, and now we have this Holocene signature of 
but you know, this post ablation signature of having had that hydraulic head. Has anybody looked at the cumulative effect over the, the whole Pleistocene? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Jennifer, can I ask uh -huh. you to repeat the question? Just yeah, sure. So yeah. the question was, um, has anybody looked at the repeated effect of, we know during the Pleistocene, the Laurentide Ice Sheet advanced and retreated about 20 times. And so the picture I painted was really the last glacial maximum. But um, colleagues like Mark Prasan um, have built groundwater models of places like the Illinois Basin. And there we, we repeat it 20 times. And in terms of the age of the groundwater, um, I kind of glossed over it, but we don't find ages that are 15,000 years old. We find ages that are from the previous ice age. And part of the problem is that there's a lot of mixing. So the subsurface is not a perfect archive. You know, you don't see necessarily a plug of water that progresses in age from the different ice sheets. So we're probably looking at the accumulated effect, but you need absolutely all of those advances and retreats. Right. And I guess my, my follow up question to that is whether you can tell from the delta 18 value of that water whether it's primarily subglacial flow or can you tell anything about the plumbing of the Laurentide ice sheet and whether it's superglacial flow? Yeah, I love that you use that word because absolutely you can tell from noble gases that there had to have been superglacial. And then from the action isotopes, they're not as negative as you would expect. So my student, Melissa Schlegel, you have to read her paper. We, that was our hypothesis, is that it was actually snow on top of the ice sheet that was melting, like you see in Greenland today, and you get these dulins to the base of the ice sheet. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you. I've got a question, if you don't mm -hmm. mind. There's nothing on the chat. Uh, so I guess, uh, I, you know, I was wondering about uh, whether you have people that you collaborate with that look at the species level of the microbes that are there and and potentially get maybe a handle on either their evolution and i know that's incredibly difficult but uh or just the modern distribution like you know can you say anything about what what's living down there how they've changed and what's what's kind of uh, uh the controls on on that on that assemblage yeah that's a great question i guess the short answer is yes so i'm not a microbiologist but i work with microbiologists and we've published on microbes say in pools in the Powder River Basin or these shales in the Illinois Basin. So we're going to do that kind of work in the Paradox Basin. We're not only going to look at who's present, but also what they're doing to try to understand. Um, my, I suspect that it's, most, it's going to be bacteria and archaea. That's what we find everywhere. But we're going to be doing those comparisons because that's what I find most fascinating is how to life in the Colorado Plateau compared to life elsewhere. I was curious to know, is there anything common to the wells in the paradox that you got biodegradation signatures from, or depth, or safely? Or yeah, um, they were all from above the salt yeah. in the Honaker Trail in the Potlet. So this is why I want to, with this new project, go looking for shallower oil reservoirs. So I got wind that there were some tar sands further to the north. And so I would hypothesize that as you go shallower in the sequence, if there are either residual oil or natural gas, then you would have more biodegradation because it would be in contact with water circulating. And we would suspect in the salt, there should be no life. Right. That salt was so sealed and so deeply buried. Okay, well, thank you everybody for your attention and great questions. Okay, well, another round of applause. Thank you very much. Got clapping emojis there. So, <laughs> All right. well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. So.